All right. Wow. I'm taking you back, huh? <laughs> All right. I don't even know what that means. But <laughs> <laughs> Steve, welcome. Thanks very much. I'm much prouder of my time at Berkeley than at Oxford. Um, <laughs> it was certainly much longer, anyway. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, you know changing uh, paradigms around privacy. None of which I think will come as a surprise to you, but I think it's interesting to view them from the point of view of uh, organizations that aren't Uber and LinkedIn and uh, Google and so on, but from everyday organizations and about the way that I would claim very few companies are really taking advantage of a pretty fundamental shift in attitudes towards the collection of data, which is that people largely don't care that much. Um, and so, uh, hence the title of my talk, uh, and what I want to do is I want to uh, give some examples of what Alpine has done and companies like ours um, to help organizations to make use of their data, but really make the point that this is not very common uh, and that there's a, a really underutilized mass of data out there that I think folk, everyday folks like you and me actually want organizations to use modulo you know, certain controls. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think um, it is underutilized. Um, but the... The topic was suggested to me uh, a couple of months ago, starting to think about data privacy, when my husband was, uh, had just bought tickets to go and see a Beyonce show down in San Jose. Um, and I overheard him a couple of days later exclaim with delight uh, to his phone, I love the internet, he said. Uh, and um, he's very computer illiterate. I don't think he'll mind me saying that. So I was a little curious what he, what he meant by that. He really doesn't care very much about computers. He um, maybe loves his phone, but I love the internet. And what he meant was that he, uh, an ad had just popped up on Facebook on his feed um, talking about a limo service that you could take between San Francisco and San Jose. Um, the implicit suggestion that he could take that, as in fact he did, um, so that he could get um, fully drunk at the Beyonce concert and enjoy it uh, and not worry about driving home. And it occurred to me, of course, that he was delighted uh, that the internet was spying on him uh, and using information that he gleaned about the tickets that he purchased in order to make this uh, online ads be served up for him. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And I think that, in general, my hypothesis would be uh, that people like him, people, broadly speaking, don't care that much about privacy. Um, of course, it's a very broad statement. Uh, but in general, it's just not something we worry about. And uh, that should be very clear, right? So it is very, very easy to encrypt your email. Uh, but almost nobody does. Uh, maybe if you work a sort of high-ranking function in government, whether you have a private server or not, um, <laughs> you, will, you will encrypt your email. But I don't. Uh, I mean, Google is fairly careful uh, about uh, email going back and forth over the wire. Uh, but broadly speaking, if I am sending... Uh, email from my uh, from from a regular client. There is all sorts of risks associated with that. Um, it's very easy to anonymize your browsing behavior. I don't mean just you know, Control Shift N or whatever it is within your browser, but just like for all of your regular communication from your, from your browser, just to in ensure that all of that is encrypted. There are open source free solutions to do this. How many people use something like Tor or anything like it? How many of you even have heard of Tor? As an, okay, very good. How many people use it? Yeah, so here's my point, right? There's maybe 10 of you out of, a, out of, uh, out of roughly 100, say. Um, we use the default settings uh, on social media applications, which are generally pretty permissive when it comes to sharing. I don't think they're egregious, but they're certainly fairly permissive in terms of the data that we want to collect, uh, that we want to share. Um, we regularly hand over plain text copies of our credit card information, uh, complete with date and security code, uh, to random people around the world. Um, and uh, as an example of data privacy around the government uh, usage, for example, the Patriot Act uh, back in, um, I assume it's 2002, uh, was passed almost with no uh, serious debate. Um, and since then, of course, the USA Freedom Act, um, many years later under President Obama, uh, reduced some of the powers of the Patriot Act, but Largely, it stands as is, and, and even provisions around mass surveillance um, haven't really limited the power of the NSA to uh, do bulk collection of information. Uh, um, it is still possible for them, under certain circumstances, to do that. Um, and I didn't see many people protesting that in the streets. Now, I would argue this is especially true in the U.S. Uh, we're especially unconcerned about these things in the U.S. 
Um, uh, you know, we're very free with credit cards in a way that isn't tr so true in Europe, where they have those little tricorders that the waiter brings to you at, uh, at the side of your table. People in Europe sort of jealously hold on to their credit cards. Um, and, uh, you know, we are pretty much the nation of oversharers uh, when it comes to uh, social media uh, in a way that isn't necessarily true in other, company, in other countries. Uh, there are many examples of this. Um, uh, and yet, it's interesting that, uh, you know, if you look at Europe, where I think there are relatively modest but still sensible controls around data privacy, uh, those are actually based on principles established by the US. So, for example, in Europe, there is fairly strict control, or not strict controls, but there are moderate but sensible controls, but strictly enforced around data privacy with the European uh, Data Directive. The European Data Directive is a perfectly common sense set of laws. Um, if you've been to Europe, you'll notice, you know, you get these little warnings about cookies being used on a website. In general, they're, they're sensible laws around the collection of use and sharing of data. They're actually based on principles, the fair information practice principles outlined by the FTC here in the U.S., but never enforced as law uh, here in the U.S. So I would suggest that um, the adoption of, of these fairly modest laws, such as they have in Europe, would be a good thing in the U.S., um, and uh, many arguments have made that it can actually reduce incidences of identity theft and certainly, I think, places useful controls on large organizations. Um, I would also advocate for, personally, for repeal of the Patriot Act, uh, and certainly many of its provisions. So I think that there are sensible things that we can do about data privacy, but I would still claim that there are good reasons why, broadly speaking, we don't care. Um, I'll start out more controversially. I think there are arguments, despite what I've just said, that says that the mass surveillance of anonymized metadata, communications metadata by the NSA, uh, and public social media data may lead and may have led to a reduction in uh, criminal acts and terrorist acts. Uh, the data around this seem to me uncertain, um, but I, I think I could buy that argument. I think less controversially, it is clear that we want organizations like Uber and Airbnb and so on to spy on us and to use that information uh, to serve us better. You know, we actively encourage Netflix and Spotify and Pandora and Apple to gather information about our listening preferences and to make recommendations to us based on that and the data of other users. Uh, we're delighted when Google pops up a little notice telling us that, in fact, we should take uh, 280 instead of 101 uh, based on driving behaviors of people uh, in, in the immediate geography around you. Uh, we're excited when we get a recommendation, as I just suggested, um, uh, in our Facebook feed. Uh, we even want Facebook to tell us who, we should, who of our friends we should talk to in the morning. Um, so I think that those are largely beneficial and, and benign things that we welcome. Um, none of that, I think, is, is terribly controversial or, or, or really new. What I'm saying, uh, based on our experience at Alpine, is that very few organizations do this. Uh, so there is a lot of hype around big data, and artificial intelligence, and machine learning, um, especially here in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, it is a topic that is on everybody's lips. When I come to Berkeley to do recruiting, everybody wants to be a data scientist. There is a sense that it is just out there and it is happening, and it's not true. Um, most of the organizations, everyday organizations, that are, as a, uh, somebody said the other day, I can't remember who said this, said, you know, it's easy to find data, ses, da data scientists, it's easy to hire them, unless you're east of Sacramento. Um, so that, mean, that includes New York and that includes many great cities uh, with great universities and uh, great companies. Um, uh, it is generally true, as we have found as a company, uh, that when we talk to your average Fortune 1000 company or even a smaller company in the U.S., that even if they are collecting large quantities of data, they're not actually doing very much with it. Now, I think the reason for that is, is actually pretty clear if you spend a little time looking at this. It's because of a lack of expertise. So it's a good reason why lots of people want to be data scientists at the career fair in uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Hall. Um, uh, but it's also because the technologies are overwhelming and the techniques are pretty complex. Uh, and again, one of the things we do as a company is to try and make that a little bit easier for folks. Um, but uh, the examples that I'm going to show you of the type of projects that companies like Alpine, not just Alpine, have, have worked on are, are really the exceptions that, that maybe prove the rule. Uh, uh, one of the 
silly examples of where companies, I think, don't take advantage of data is, you know, I, I just took this this weekend, I logged on to my Wells Fargo account, uh, and right there at the top, they're offering me a your first mortgage. Um, well, that's fine, but I already have a mortgage. I have a mortgage with Wells Fargo. Ah. Um, it does not take tremendously sophisticated <laughs> analytics to offer me perhaps more, more salient things. There are financial products I'd actually be quite interested in doing. Uh, I should probably do estate planning, for example, and start thinking about some, uh, some better insurance as I get a little older. Uh, no, don't get anything around that. Um, another example is uh, a friend of mine last year, he was just reminding me of this uh, just as we went through Halloween. Uh, last year for Halloween, he decided to go as Farrah Fawcett. There was a whole team of his friends who went as Farrah Fawcett to the New Orleans uh, Halloween shindig. And, uh, and so he bought his, uh, his high heels and his wig. Uh, and for the following year, he was constantly offered from shoe stores and from wig stores uh, on Facebook and other sites uh, lots, of, uh, lots of items of clothing. Um, now, I'm not saying that offers should, uh, uh, should be gendered in any way, but nevertheless, you'd think that the analytics would tell you that if you're buying uh, wigs and pumps uh, on October 30th, you probably aren't terribly interested in buying them throughout the rest of the year. Uh, so, uh, my point is, right, most normal, everyday organizations don't know how to take advantage of the data. Now, let me give you some exceptions and maybe some ideas and some thoughts about how organizations can be using data, not just for their good, but for the good of their clients as well. Um, so we work with um, a company called uh, Evercore. They're one of these companies you've never heard of, but are actually um, pretty central to the way that healthcare uh, uh, claims and uh, medical requests are processed in the U.S. So when a, a hospital or a doctor or provider wants to um, uh, perform a certain medical procedure, maybe an MRI or an X-ray or whatever it might be, um, uh, then that has to get approved by the insurance company and Evercore is sort of the, the middleman in, in terms of doing that. Um, now, historically, the way that they've done that is to have an army of doctors and nurses, uh, generally sort of semi-retired doctors and nurses and other clinical professionals, uh, who will review the doctor's notes and the, and the medical records uh, and make an adjudication about whether that, whether that medical pr uh, procedure is suitable or not. Uh, well, that's an expensive and time-consuming process. It slows down processing for the patient, uh, and it costs everybody up and down the medical um, hierarchy uh, a lot of money to do that. Um, and so what they started to do is to use text analytics uh, and other machine learning processes to look at the doctor's records, the doctor's notes, the EMRs, the electronic medical records, uh, to make a determination. They will look at all the historical information garnered from having all these humans, these professional uh, people look at these historical cases and they'll do machine learning and uh, natural language processing to make a classification procedure. A fairly simple uh, machine learning technique really, a fairly classic thing. You'd, like, you'd say yes or a no. It's actually slightly more complicated than a yes or a no, but broadly speaking it's a yes or a no and you've got all these attributes based on the text and other attributes of the patient and the medical procedure and the doctor and so on. Uh, and so you want a classification routine looking at, the, uh, at those features. Uh, and with that, they are able essentially to automate, completely automate, the most high likelihood cases, and that accounts for about 20% of all the cases that they have to do. Now, you may say that uh, the negative effect of that is that they will lay off those doctors and nurses. Actually not. What they're doing is they're just taking on more cases, uh, but keeping um, the, the size of the call centers are, are pretty much uh, static, I would imagine, and, uh, and, uh, and bringing on um, more businesses and bringing on more cases and adjudicating them more, more rapidly. Um, Harvest Media is one of the digis big biggest digital media uh, companies in Europe. Uh, so they, another middleman in a sense, they act between the publishing, the publishing sites like the Yahoo's and the ESPN.com and so on. Uh, and the advertisers, the companies. So for them, companies like L'Oreal or uh, Virgin Atlantic or whoever. Um, uh, so a pretty big company, and what they do, amongst many things, offering up analytic services to their clients, is to enable them to optimize the way that they market to their customers, to optimize the way that, say, a company like L'Oreal will advertise online or in emails um, uh, or even in traditional media to their clients. And the way that you do that is you will look at detailed browsing behavior. Historically in the marketing world, as you probably know, um, historically in the marketing world, the way you will target an advertising campaign, whether that's email, media, 
uh, other media like uh, print or TV um, or uh, uh, direct mail through, through, through the letterbox, um, will be, you know, let's target all women in major U.S. cities between the ages of 18 and 34. Very, very basic uh, attributes of, of people. That's been the way that marketing has been done for a very long time. Well, what Havas and companies like them can do is to look at detailed browsing behavior, detailed online behavior, to really understand what are the interests of these person and how can we better position advertisements and offers uh, uh, to make them more relevant. Uh, that requires an enormous amount of crunching of data. If you think about you know, hundreds of millions of cookies, of users, uh, each with however many clicks a day that, the, that they do, that data has to be crunched through in order to come up with these highly detailed profiles. So this idea of marketing to people based on highly individualized um, profiles built up from their activities is a really powerful idea. It's becoming increasingly common. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting idea. I want to return to that a little bit later uh, when we think about data privacy and the ramifications of that. Um, We've done work with National Institutes of Health and I think also Centers for Disease Control. I, I, I was just thinking on the way over here, I may have this wrong, but um, uh, with a couple of government organizations, uh, we looked at, or rather they looked at, um, an outbreak of HIV cases in Indiana. Um, the many reasons why this happened, some of them political, sometime, some of them purely social. These were mostly looking at sort of the, the social and medical factors and looking at patterns of drug abuse uh, in social networks within that community and identifying these sort of triggering points for when HIV, the HIV outbreak occurred. Um, and that was a case where the, the government uh, and health organizations could learn from that uh, for future cases and understand when early intervention programs might, uh, might have been useful. Um, the IRS is working with... <laughs> um, it was funny, one of our sales guys the other day, so we're, we're still in... Um, um, the IRS is actually a customer, but uh, we're looking for um, some additional work that we can do there, to, uh, ways to increase the account. And um, uh, he called up, uh, was mentioning on a sales call, he said, I just had the greatest meeting with the IRS. Um, and we were thinking, not many people say that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so one of the things that the IRS does is to try and look for tax fraud and abuse. Um, I would argue this is a good thing to do. And... Uh, uh, there are some cases when, for example, somebody hasn't paid federal taxes for 25 years, it's pretty clear you probably want to have an audit there. Um, but there are cases that are much more subtle than that. Uh, and again, you can look at historical cases uh, and identify detailed behavior in the, uh, in, the, in the tax profile of a particular individual or, or company uh, and use that to identify whether the IRS should go and investigate that. IRS, as you can imagine, is a very large, bloated bureaucracy. This is not any particular insight that I have, it's just the way that these things are. And um, uh, going after and investigating cases is very expensive. And my understanding of this, just from public information, is that it doesn't happen very often because it is such a time-consuming and difficult process because you have to look through the underlying data. Well, again, with machine learning techniques and looking at big data and then applying machine learning against the historical data, you can begin to flag things automatically and therefore go after and investigate them. Have much more comprehensive reviews for tax fraud and abuse uh, and, and do it uh, at a lower cost. Um, big manufacturing companies like those listed here want to do things like preventative maintenance. So if you can look at a widget that is going through a factory and see how it passes or doesn't pass certain tests, um, you can begin to predict whether it might actually fail in the field, or you can do preventative maintenance on cars, for example, and actually make suggestions. One of the things that I would love, uh, I don't own a car, but I would love, uh, when I did, to have uh, my car company write to me and suggest things in advance rather than wait for things to go wrong, and there are perfectly well-understood methods for being able to do this. Um, I think it's quite rare that manufacturing organizations actually apply these sort of machine learning techniques. Again, very large quantities of data both in the factory and that are being fed back now from cars that have uh, 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 more elaborate sensors in them. Uh, but this can be used to do preventative maintenance and is a, is a very powerful technique that, again, I think is, is not widely used but is, uh, is beginning to happen. Uh, finally, um, I mentioned Silver Spring, did some work with them some years ago, so they're a smart meter company, so they make those little smart meters that you have attached to the front of your houses or in front of your apartments, and um, uh, so they will supply those to PG&E and other electricity companies around, around the country. Um, notice, interestingly enough, but a lot of the companies that I've been talking about right are these middle men, I hate to be sexist, but these sort of like uh, intermediary companies 
um, uh, that uh, were collecting large amounts of data. And I think those are typically the sorts of companies that actually have the largest amount of data and are often underutilizing it. Uh, but anyway, SilverSpring collects the smart meter data, and obviously they'd like to do something more useful than just sort of billing. Uh, so lots of interesting cases here that, that, that you can do with these smart meters. So for example, you can look at uh, uh, historical fraud related to electricity usage and gas usage um, and be able to uh, identify that automatically. Um, in particular, one of the things that uh, a company like SilverSpring can do is to, is to build up fingerprints of usage, right? So if you're a single family dwelling, you're likely to have a fingerprint of usage over the course of 24 hours where you know, get a little burst around 6 to 7 a.m. that sort of dies down around 8.30. It's pretty quiet during the day with regular blips for the refrigerator coming on. Uh, and then later at night, there's a burst as people start to come home. There's a, a larger burst as everybody sort of gets ready for bed and you're turning off lights, uh, turning lights on and, and, and so on. Uh, and then finally, it quietens down around sort of 10 or 11. Um, so you can identify these fingerprints. There's maybe a few dozen of these fingerprints. And then you can put people in those buckets, right? So you can use clustering techniques in order to identify these common fingerprints and then group people in them. And then you can see, well... Uh, is there a particular dwelling that doesn't seem to fit into the right fingerprint? Or is there um, a, a, a factory that suddenly shifts from one fingerprint to another almost overnight that might be suspicious for some reason if there's no change in the underlying business? Um, uh, one of the, my favorite examples that I saw is where you'll see something like a standard fingerprint but where there's these regular blips, especially during particular weather patterns, uh, like maybe every, every few minutes you'll see one of these blips and it's actually a, a sign that the vegetation is getting, this happens in Hawaii a lot, for example, and the vegetation is getting overgrown and it's starting to bump up against the electricity wires and so they can use this to do preventative vegetative maintenance, as they call it, uh, basically go and chop the tree down. Um, so lots of interesting ways of, of using smart meter data apart from just billing your customers. Okay, so as I say... Um, I think these are somewhat the exceptions. There are so many organizations, in almost all of these cases, when a company like Alpine comes in, you realize that they're collecting huge amounts of data on technologies like Hadoop and uh, uh, massively parallel databases, but not actually doing much with it. That may seem shocking. It's like, well, why would they put that in place? Well, you know, these organizations are slow. Um, they will often have a big sort of IT strategy to get something installed, but they don't necessarily have the human expertise to, to make the full value out of it. Or they'll use the data, but only for the most basic sort of elementary historical reporting and, and dashboards. Um, so um, we have found time and time again that we are shocked by fairly sophisticated, wealthy organizations hardly doing anything with predictive analytics or machine learning against their data where there's so much value that could be created. In almost all of these cases that I've outlined, there is one person in the company who is sort of a visionary who said, we need to be doing more. Um, and then they found that the tools are available to them. Uh, it's just a matter of having that understanding. Um, uh, one of the examples I was just thinking about just as I was walking up the hill here is that, you know, I... So I'm getting closer to 50. Uh, I'm starting to think about sort of midlife health stuff. And I would love it. I would love it if, uh, if Sutter Health, uh, which is my health organization, would write to me and suggest things. I found that I really need, as I get older, I found, and, and many people in my sort of cohort have learned this, I need to be very proactive about my health. I need to be reading magazines. I need to be learning about what's available and suggesting tests. I suggest tests to my doctor that turn out to have a real effect based on my family history, my own, uh, my own health history. The doctor's too busy. I would love machine learning to be set loose on my own personal data and the data of people in my cohort. Uh, to go and make recommendations to be about th new things that I should be doing. This just simply doesn't happen very much, uh, hardly at all, as far as I know. Um, so I, I think there are lots of these opportunities, and uh, part of the job of a company like ours is to help uh, companies to, uh, to take them. So um, that's partly what I want to leave you with, is just the idea that, that you know, machine learning and data is a very exciting area, and I'm sure a lot of people... Uh, in this room, especially on the students, sort of want to get involved in that. It's a great thing to do. But don't forget about all the ordinary organizations out there that aren't Uber, um, who also need data scientists, who can be doing really meaningful things with their data. But, you know, I was chatting about this with my team, a team of engineers and data scientists, mostly younger engineers and scientists. And, um, uh, and they broadly agreed with me. They said, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to make sure that, you know, this, this all made sense. They said, absolutely. I, I don't really care that much about data privacy, or I, it's, it's not something I spend a lot of time uh, worrying about. Um, you know, the, you know there's, there are degrees around this, right, they were saying. That we actually sat around, we thought, well, what would be sensible rules to have around data privacy? And it was interesting, we, the rules that we came up with, like, let me know that you're collecting data, let me know what you're going to do with it, 
Um, tell me who you're sharing with it, uh, uh, sharing uh, the data with. Um, let me look at my own data. Um, or common sense rules that are actually enshrined in those FIPP rules that I was talking about right at the beginning. It's interesting, they're sort of very common sense. Um, and they said, you know, in a sense, it's a little bit like the Cheers principle in that, you know, I want, um, I want a company to be like a friendly bartender uh, or shopkeeper who knows my name, knows what I like to order, um, but also just don't, don't be creepy. That's sort of the basic rule. Um, but they also made an observation that I thought was very interesting. They said, look, um, there's, there's the potential for organizations, companies, governments, uh, to go one better than maybe even the friendly shopkeeper, but certainly the traditional marketing methods of old. Remember I was telling you, the Nielsen days of 18 to 34, male versus female, black versus white. Uh, to go much further than that, to go one better than those old marketing methods, um, and use the detailed profiles that we build up over time uh, to have a much more meaningful interaction with their clients. Um, and in a sense, they said, you know, evaluate me, interact with me, but based on my actions, not my attributes. And I thought that was kind of a liberating idea, and it reminded us a little bit of, of this guy. Um, and it seems appropriate to end with him. You know, we started off with Beyonce, who is by any measure a superwoman. Um, and Nietzsche said, uh, become who you are. And what he meant by that is to resist the normalizing forces of nationalism and, and religion and, and race and gender and so on, to become uniquely you, to, 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 to become who you were meant to be um, by those sort of internal uh, aspects of yourself, uh, rather than being forced down a particular path by sort of mass forces. Um, and he didn't mean that to apply to everybody. Uh, he was very explicit about that. Um, but I think it's perhaps not too fanciful to say that with the internet, with these profiles that are collected, these data-driven profiles that are based on the actions and the activities, that Havas example that I was talking about earlier, that builds up these highly individuated profiles that, um, you know, this is a week maybe for optimism. It's like, you know, maybe the internet offers us an opportunity to become fully realized individuals online. At the very least, I think that in terms of the interaction that we have with bureaucracies and with companies, there is significant opportunity with data and machine learning to make those conversations a lot more meaningful and valuable. Okay, thank you. Steve, we'll go, thank go you very me. much for that. We've got maybe two or three minutes for a couple of questions before we break. I want to... Offer some reflections. Yes, we get a mic down here. Thank you. Hi, I had a question on something I'm not quite sure if you touched upon about deciding what data to collect because something I've heard about a lot about is a lot of companies are collecting a lot of data and from that metadata you're understanding a lot more and so yeah, yeah. a company has a social responsibility to only be collecting the data that they need. Yeah. How do you kind of coach other organizations to choose which data they should collect? So I, I think that uh, in general, frankly, organizations are quite conservative about what they collect. Um, and I would argue maybe in the spirit of this talk that they, they almost don't cl collect enough. Uh, there are, uh, in this country, again, very few rules about what you can collect. I mean, the, there aren't many exceptions. HIPAA, the HIPAA regulations in healthcare, is actually very, very explicit about what you should connect. And it's odd in some ways that we should be extremely strict about collecting personally identifiable health data, but then, uh, and there are some rules also about financial data, but that's about it, right? Um, so, uh, in general, where we've made recommendations about this, it's that um, when it comes to online behavior, as long as you are very explicit, number one, with your clients, with your customers, about what you're collecting, then it's okay. And also, getting to the point that um, my team was making, it was like, don't do anything surprising, right? So there are cases where people have used, especially data that's shared across different organizations, where they've used that to make recommendations that come on a little bit creepy, because like when I'm interacting with a website, I kind of know intuitively, intuitively what it's collecting about me. So it's not surprising when it makes a recommendation based on my purchase behavior. But if it then includes some data that's gotten, say, from my insurance company, 
then that's a little bit weird. So in general, it's like it's fine to collect anything as long as you tell people, and broadly speaking, as long as it's not creepy. Uh, but if anything, I would honestly say that most organizations are quite conservative about, uh, about what they keep. Um, I, th I think another point to make there is that um, historically what companies have done is to only collect summary information about people. They haven't stored that long-term sort of transactional detail. Technologies like Hadoop now make that fairly cheap and easy to do. And we actually think, again, that's a good thing. It gets to my last point, which is learn about me from activities. That summary information is in some ways biased and, and, and cheap and too easy. Okay. There's a question there, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your discussion on this uh, question. Now, obviously, most of the, uh, the data uh, collection uh, strategies for companies are buried in terms and conditions that we click through yeah. and not actually read. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Do you see any, any uh, potential for different companies maybe to make this more bold-faced and say a bit, a bit more transparent about what types of data they're using and how they're using it? Yeah. I, where was I recently? I think I was actually making a political donation, interesting enough. I can't remember, but um, I was shocked. The, the agreement, I mean, they weren't collecting an awful lot of data about me, but they were collecting my job uh, information and some other basic sort of demographics about me. And the agreement that I signed was extremely straightforward. I mean, it was almost shocking. It's like, how can this possibly have got past your lawyers, right? Um, and I think, um, getting back to the point we were making earlier, it's like, look, if you're, if you're making me sign term con terms and conditions that say, you know, a lot of these things are around liability, about what happens when you click on something in websites. So if you click on something and suddenly your mouse electrocutes you, you know, they're not going to be liable for that because, you know, software can always go wrong. Um, that's broadly the, the pattern around some of these things. But I think, actually, to the point that we made earlier, and this is enshrined in the European directive, is like when it comes to data, you need to be very explicit about what you're collecting. And I think being upfront about that, uh, and I think Facebook does a pretty good job of this, being upfront about what you're collecting and what you're sharing and so on, should be in very, very plain language. It actually builds up confidence and, and sort of makes you want to have a relationship with that organization. Okay. One more question. Anyone? Okay, we've got one there. Robin. All right, so th this morning I talked about uh, what we do at Castlight around a lot of the health recommendations that you were yep. talking about. Yep. And, and so we use claims data, demographic data, and, but mostly we use data that we have ourselves. And, and we have shied away a little bit from exactly that of like going out and acquiring data about people. And yeah, yeah, though yeah. we know that would, that we are very confident that would improve our models. Yeah. Um, but we, and we try and be very explicit in the privacy policy about what we do. But like the, about the collecting data, like in the past, we had not been like super obsessive about the quality of the diagnosis codes and the claims. And now when we're doing this, it, like, it becomes very, very important. And so um, it is it, like we'll have regrets at times of we should have collected more because then we realize this could yeah. be when you're doing feature engineering, mm. you're like that would be an incredible feature. But we haven't been collecting that data. And so now we have to wait to get a decent amount of an, a time with that data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've seen similar things. There was some early work we did with a, a bank, a small bank um, based out here in the West. Uh, they had a similar problem. And not so much they hadn't been collecting the data, but the data just happened to be very dirty. A lot of it had been collected by tellers uh, historically, right? And this use case goes about five or six years now. Uh, so historic, most of the historical data at that point had not been collected online. They're, again, a fairly small bank. Um, there were lots of techniques, you know, that you can use to do interpolation of data where they could... Um, uh, essentially fill in the gaps. Uh, and they used that then to make uh, product recommendations as the use case that they were working on. Um, uh, so I think there are ways of getting around uh, dirty data. As, and as well, you know, if, if you've got a sufficient amount of data that you, you, can avoid, you can ignore some of the noise, you know, as long as there are sort of clear trends. Uh, but yeah, we've seen clear stuff. In fact, Marion, who's one of our data scientists who's working on the Evercore case right now, is dealing with a lot of dirty data um, and uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's part of the territory, I guess. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Steve, thanks very much.